how do you pay your rent when you don't have any income? How do you, for those that, are, that, that have jobs and they scale back their hours so they're not making the money that they were making before and you can't even afford to put gas in your car? Since February and the actual shutdown of the city and closing down establishments and laying people off from work and losing their jobs, those numbers have increased tremendously where we're engaged just about every day with someone that needs some assistance. It's a struggle, yeah. We've seen a lot of that. Even with this pandemic, God has to remind us sometimes that we are in need of him all the time. After talking with me and Alton and some of the other folks in the area, the Mercy team tried to compile, compile something that we all could do to help, could come along beside everybody and Meet the need. We've been able to do that with us, as well as Christian Service Ministry, some of the food banks, uh, the Wildham Food Bank, Pastor Davis, and doing those things that they do and assisting us and some of the other ministries to help keep food on the table for the folks in this area. As we developed uh, relationships, and, and I would, with Christian Service Ministry, we, of what they do, they have tapped into uh, wealth of resources and they're already well connected so that was a no-brainer. Alton of course has been a part of what we do uh, in helping at South Park as well as helping in Fairfield um, with what they're going through in the ministry there as well so that's a no-brainer. A church in Wildham is, is one that's fairly new and seeing what uh, Pastor Davis does and how he's tapped into some resources and uh, and helping the people in Fairfield, here, the Wildham area, um, part of Inslee that goes through and connects around this area, was just a no-brainer. It's just something that needed to be done. And, and, and as we talked about it and visited those sites and met with the, the leaders of those organizations, we just felt that those were the five main missions that we need to really support because they're really helping the inner city and those areas that are really hurting. And I think it was like $50,000 that was dis dispersed between all of us to help meet the need. That is awesome. I think it's important for people to realize that their local churches are the ones that are there with them in the trenches. Then fighting uh, hunger and, and not being able to provide for your family, that we feel their pain because we're here in those communities. I pray that through this that we're doing will help open the doors of the church more and allow people to come in and say, wow, you know, I don't just have to go when I need a meal, but I need to go and thank God for allowing folks to be so kind and to show their heart and their love for one another. To see someone hurt or a child starving and hungry and feel compassionate that I have plenty and it wouldn't hurt me to share with them. That's what the people in this community have seen. And seeing the church step up. You can't get anything in when your hand is so tight. But when you learn to give, and remember that God has always given to us, he wakes us up every morning, starts us on our way, we have a reasonable portion of health and strength. And I just think that's important for us as individuals to realize that. You know, what has been a blessing to us is Oak Mountain has come along the side of us and helped us do an awesome ministry in the church. Not just about the, this church, but God's church as a whole. And that's what's been a blessing to me, to see what the body of Christ looks like. How it doesn't matter if you're black, white, blue, or green, we all come together to try to meet the need of one another and do what we're doing. It makes me think back uh, on the evangelist, the class that I took, uh, how we have the perfect opportunity to evangelize those that are down on their luck or going through or some of the homeless individuals. It's just been wonderful. Just see how God can use a simple meal and then we also have an opportunity to lead them to Christ. Caring, feeding them, and leading them to Christ. That is just a beautiful video that introduces the text 
that we're going to read this morning. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8. We're staying in our series through this great letter. The theme of our series is Strength in Weakness. And the particular theme this morning is Strength in Weakness through Generosity. And as that video made clear, there are lots of people right now because of COVID in particular, who are experiencing great weakness, whether it's uh, the urban poor, whether it's uh, people with other kinds of needs. And what we see in that video is a principle that Paul refers to from the Old Testament. It's called the manna principle. And the manna principle that we're going to watch, we're going to read about in just a few moments, has to do with there being equality in the church. Now, not socialism, but voluntary equality is one of God's desires. For instance, when you look at Exodus 16 and the manna, you find that every single person was to collect one omer of manna. It's a certain measurement, and everybody was to receive the same measurement and we're going to read in the passage in verse 15 of 2 Corinthians 8 that go, those who gathered a lot didn't have any left over. And those who gathered little never had a lack. Now why is that? It's because the church was looking out for its own. When it comes to generosity, God wants us to look out for the church and the kingdom and the growth and health of the kingdom. Now, in particular, 2 Corinthians 8 is about a very unique point in time. It has to do with Paul's ministry from A.D. 52 to A.D. 57. You may not know this, but not only was Paul interested in preaching the gospel of grace... But during those five years, there was one passionate ministry on Paul's heart. And that was that the Gentile churches would use their resources to take care of the Jerusalem church. You see, the Jerusalem church was the reason why the Gentile churches got into existence to begin with. The the church after Pentecost was formed in Jerusalem, and there were many, many converts. And then very quickly, the Jerusalem church sent missionaries and ministry partners to different parts of the Roman Empire. So single-handedly initially, the Jerusalem church and then the church at Antioch, they funded all these ministries around the empire. The problem was it depleted the resources of the Jerusalem church. The Jerusalem church was in big trouble financially. Not only were they funding missions, but many of the converts in the Jerusalem church were immediately persecuted. They were immediately ostracized because the rest of the Jews in Jerusalem who didn't become Christians immediately persecuted Christians as some kind of wacko cult. And as a result, these Jews in Jerusalem who had been converted, they lost their jobs. They lost opportunities to provide for their families. They were, again, shunned by much of the city. Not only that, But during this early part of the church after Pentecost, there were droughts and there were famines that even more heavily taxed the Jerusalem church because they had mercy ministry and they had deacons that were uh, in charge of the mercy ministry. And even with people in Jerusalem like Barnabas selling their properties and bringing proceeds and laying at the church's feet, even still... They were being depleted in their funding. One of the reasons is, is because during the famine and the drought, inflation was 300% in Jerusalem. Prices skyrocketed, even further hampering Christians. Not only that, but the government didn't have much money either. And so taxes in Jerusalem were nearing 40%. And so Paul goes to the Gentile churches, in particular, 
In 2 Corinthians 8, he talks about the Macedonian churches. Now you think, well, what are the Macedonian churches? You'd be surprised. You know who they are. You ever read the book of Philippians? Philippi was in northeastern Greece. It is a Macedonian church. You ever read 1 or 2 Thessalonians? That's a Macedonian church. So Paul went to the Macedonians, the Philippians, and the Thessalonians, and he went to the Corinthians as well. He went to all the churches that he planted, and he said, now look, the Jerusalem church sacrificed for us to hear the gospel. I even, Paul said, persecuted them, and they even sacrificed themselves for me in my ministry. So here's what I want to do. I want there to be unity between the Gentile branch of the church and the Jewish branch of the church, and they shared with you spiritual resources, so I want you to share with them material resources. And oh, by the way, that's exactly the kind of equation that Paul uses between congregants and the local church. In Galatians 6, Paul says, let the one who is taught good things Share with the one who teaches. Now, it's not talking about me in particular. It's talking about with your church. So Paul uses the same principle, and he says, let's make an offering for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Now, a year ago, according to the text from when it was written, the Corinthians said they would contribute to the Jerusalem church, but they haven't followed through. So Paul sends Titus to say, hey, Corinthians, you started off with the desire, now follow through. Now, in order to encourage the Corinthians to follow through, Paul talks about the generosity of the Macedonians, the Philippians and the Thessalonians. And he is stunned by what they do. See, Paul wrote 2 Corinthians from the locations of the Macedonians. And he saw firsthand just how the Macedonians were inspired, empowered, and motivated to surprising generosity. Now, the fact that this unique situation is recorded in the eternal Word of God means that there are gospel principles for generosity that go way beyond this particular context. We need to understand the context, but why would God include it in Scripture if it had no application to us? The Word of God is eternal. And as Paul talks about a very specific generosity for the Jerusalem Christians, he wants it to apply more broadly to us as we're inspired to surprising generosity as well. So with all that as an introduction that you needed to understand, let's all stand out of reverence for God's Word and follow along as I read 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 15. This is God's Word. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. See, now you understand that. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify. Why could he testify? Because he's living there right now, writing this letter. Uh, I can testify beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor, for the privilege of taking part in the relief of the saints in the Jerusalem church. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you, the Corinthians, this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others, the Macedonians, that your love also is genuine, Corinthians, Oak Mountain. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, 
but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased, people in Jerusalem, uh, and you should be burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, there's that manna word, as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance spiritually may supply your need spiritually, that there may be fairness, equity, equality. And here's the quote from Exodus 16 in the matter. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Can you tell I love teaching God's Word? I just love being able to make the Word of God make sense to others. And I hope that introduction helped you understand this passage. May God bless the hearing and teaching of His inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative Word. This is God's Word. He gave it to us because He loves us. And He wants us to experience the reality of Jesus where He said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's pray. Father, uh, you included this passage because you wanted us to be motivated, inspired, excited, enthusiastic, cheerful about generosity as we're motivated by Christ and the Macedonian Christians. And so Holy Spirit, work in our hearts during these few moments together. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. If you know anything about Oak Mountain, you know that we have what's called a vision framework. And in that vision framework, we have values. We have um, what we call measures. And uh, one of those measures is surprising generosity. Now, the measures are what we perceive as being important elements of growth in a maturing disciple. So surprising generosity is one of those five marks. Now, why do we call it surprising generosity? Well, it comes from this passage. It comes from verse 5, actually, in 2 Corinthians 8, where Paul says that the Macedonians gave not as Paul expected. Well, therefore, in a surprising way, not the way Paul expected. So we are called to help disciple our church and surprising generosity. And then in verse 7, Paul reminds the Corinthians how they excel in all these different gifts. And of course, we know that some of those gifts uh, caused division in 1 Corinthians. Uh, The gift of tongues, and the gift of prophecy, and the gift of faith, and all these different gifts. They excelled in spiritual gifts. But Paul says, because of that grace, excel in the gift of of supernatural giving. So this morning, putting those two elements together, how do we excel in surprising generosity? Well, three ways. First of all, excel in surprising generosity empowered by grace. Look at verse 1. Paul says, I want you to know, Corinthians, and I want you to know, Oak Mountaineers, about the grace of God that has been given to the Macedonian churches. What God makes clear right from the start is the only way any of us will ever be transformed into surprising generosity is by the grace of God. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All through this passage, Paul says that a year earlier, when they first heard about the collection for the saints at Jerusalem, the Corinthians immediately said, we're in. It's been 12 months, and they're not yet in. And Paul says, it's only by grace will you ever participate in surprising generosity. Five times through this short passage, Paul refers to the grace of God. By the way, that's one of our values at Oak Mountain. 
surprising grace or being grace-driven. Now, what does it mean to be grace-driven? It means that one of the core motivations of Christian living is to be inspired by the unconditional love of God for us in Christ. But grace isn't merely the message of God's unconditional love. It's also the message of His supernatural, transforming power. It isn't just knowing that God loves you that's going to cause you to be surprisingly generous people, although that will help. It's actually the power of grace that does a work of grace in us that actually empowers us to give. The best example of this is, uh, is Zacchaeus. When we talk about uh, the Bible to our little children, what do we call them? We call them little wee Zacchaeus, right? Little wee Zacchaeus, shorty, right? He couldn't see Jesus. He was up on a tree. By the way, Zacchaeus was a ripoff before he was converted. Okay, he, he stole from people. He, he overtaxed them, which is basically stealing from them. He became very wealthy. And then Jesus looked at him and said, Zacchaeus, come on down. And Zacchaeus was converted right on the spot. By the way, have you been converted? Do you know Christ today? Are you sure you know that you know that you know Jesus Have you transferred your trust from your own goodness, your own efforts, your own righteousness to Jesus himself and his obedient life and his substitutionary death? Do you know Jesus? Have you been converted? Because if you've been converted, the Bible says you've been supernaturally changed. You become a new creation. You have a new heart. You have the Holy Spirit. You're brand new. And when Zacchaeus was brand new, the first thing he said was this, I now right here give away half of all my possessions. And if I've defrauded anybody, I'm going to pay back four times as much. There's something about grace, which is generosity, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's grace that means generosity. It's grace that means give freely. And when we're converted by the grace of God, we become changed by the grace of God. And as we experience the grace of God by grace, we begin to express the grace of God. And Paul says it was only the grace of God that enabled the Macedonians to engage in surprising generosity. Now look at this. The Macedonians were in just as bad of shape as the Jerusalem Christians were. The Macedonian Christians were going through uh, afflictions and poverty that we can't even fathom, that none of us have ever experienced and few of us ever will. Look at verse 2. In severe test of affliction... So they're already being afflicted over in some way, persecution. Their abundant joy, they had joy in suffering. That's what we've been talking about in 2 Corinthians. And they were in extreme poverty. And yet all of that added up to overwhelming generosity. Now that is an equation that only makes sense in light of grace. Let me put it to you mathematically. Severe affliction, let's give that a value of negative one. Abundant joy, let's give that a value of positive one. So you get negative one plus one. And then extreme poverty. The Greek is rock bottom. They had hit rock bottom financially. So mathematically, you have severe affliction minus one, abundance of joy plus one, rock bottom poverty minus one, minus one plus one minus one equals minus one, but not in the equation of grace. Because Paul says there's severe affliction minus one, plus their abundant joy plus one, their extreme poverty, minus one, doesn't equal minus one, but instead equals 100,000. You think that makes no sense. That's not good math. It's gospel math. When the grace of God shows up in a life, that life is changed. Look at verse 3. Paul says, empowered by grace, and and Paul is giving us examples here of grace-empowered, surprising generosity. They gave according to their means, and even beyond their means. Now, what does it mean to give according to your means? Clearly, tithing. Okay? 
Every one of us who earns any money at all can tithe according to our means. Because tithing is simply giving 10% of what God enables you to have. Now, I realize not all of us tithe. But if you're not, it's because, honestly, I say this pastorally and kindly, something in your life is out of whack. There is nobody who earns a dollar that can't give 10%. God's given you a dollar. He's asking for 10 cents back. Tithing is always according to ability. Now, if we don't have the 10%, that means we're giving to other things before we take the 10% out. That's why God in the Old Testament called it the first fruits. You pay God first. And then He still owns the 90% that we use. But we pay God first. Now, if there's no check at the end of the month, it's because we've not paid God first if we haven't tithed. I'm not shaming anybody here. I'm just laying it out very clearly. Anyone who makes any money can tithe. That is according to your ability. If you're not tithing, it's because something in your life is out of whack. You've overspent in other areas. And God says, empowering grace enables you to make a life change. How many times through Corinthians have I talked about the covenant? The one covenant of grace. And the early expression of the one covenant was the Old Testament church. And the later expression of the one covenant of grace is the New Testament church. And therefore there's continuity and unity between Israel and the church. There's continuity and unity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament makes very clear that giving 10% of our income as first fruits, that is the floor of generosity. And you don't even engage in surprising generosity until you give beyond your 10%. And that is exactly what Paul says here. Verse 3, they gave according to their means. Everybody can give according to their means if our lives are ordered by God's priorities. They tithe. And then they gave beyond their means. That means they gave more than the tithe. And this this unique gift to the poor at Jerusalem was surprising generosity. But not only did they give, look what it says in verse 4. They begged Paul for the opportunity. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine us banging down Gordon Thompson's door, the administrator of our church, and banging it until it falls in and collapses? Gordon, please, let us give. Let us give. That's exactly what the Macedonians were doing. They were begging Paul for the opportunity to give. That is the power of grace because normal people just don't live that way, right? There was a story that I read in Journal Neuroscience Magazine. Now, look, I'm not a science geek. I don't make it a practice of reading uh, Neuroscience Magazine. But I did happen to find this illustration. It's a true story. A guy in Brazil, 49 years old, he had a stroke. Young for a stroke, I guess, but he had a stroke. And like many stroke victims, uh, the stroke affected his brain And his personality changed. If you've known people who have had strokes, that's very, very common. But this particular man that they labeled Mr. A in the article, he had a very unique personality change. (laughs) He started giving all of his money away. He'd go in and he'd see some kids into town. He'd see some kids that he didn't even know. And he walked into the store and bought some Cokes and some candy. And he gave them to the street kids of Brazil. He'd never even met them. Didn't even know who they were. He'd spend money for other people on other things. Just giving it away. People that were, were way better off than he was. And the article called this guy a, a pathological giver. That something had happened to his brain and he'd become a pathological giver. The gospel doesn't make us 
pathological givers. The gospel makes us supernatural givers. Empowering grace transforms our lives. Secondly, surprising generosity comes about as it's inspired by sacrifice and particularly inspired by the sacrifice of Christ. Look at verse 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might be made rich. Now why is Paul telling us this? Because he wants us to be inspired by the example of Christ to engage in sacrificial giving, sacrificial generosity. And again, remember, I say this kindly and gently, you're not engaged in sacrificial giving or supernatural or surprising generosity unless you're giving above your tithe. Okay, they gave according to their means, tithe, gave above their tithe. And to inspire that kind of generosity, Paul says, just stop and think about Jesus. Think about the incarnation. The second person of the Trinity, equal in glory and honor with the Father and the Spirit, preexistent for all eternity. He chose to take on human nature. He chose to leave the glory of heaven and be born as an infant to live in this broken world, to experience firsthand all of the temptations and to be exposed to all the brokenness that we're exposed to. But not only did he sacrifice, give up his riches by being incarnate, he went on and allowed himself to be crucified. He sacrificed his very life. He underwent pain and agony for us, his bride on earth. And Paul is saying that the Macedonians were motivated and inspired by this so that they engaged in similar acts of generosity. In verse 10, as Paul's writing to the Corinthians and to us, he says, this grace of Christ is for your benefit. Now, of course we know it's for our benefit. That's how we're saved, right? That's how we're converted. That's how we gain eternal life. We don't gain it. We receive it empty-handedly. We transfer trust from ourselves to Jesus and his finished work. But Paul's not only talking about redemption here. When he says this benefits you, he says, as you reflect on the sacrifice of Christ... That model to imitate benefits you. Jesus is, Paul is actually calling us to imitate Christ. He says that many times. That's nothing new. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In Ephesians, become imitators of God. But he actually also calls us to imitate godliness in other people. And he's calling the Corinthians and he's calling us to imitate the Macedonians who were imitating Christ. But, but how do we do that? How do we imitate the Macedonians? How do we imitate Christ? Well, look at verse 5. This is where surprising generosity comes in. Not as, they, not as Paul expected they give themselves, but verse 5, they gave themselves first to the Lord. All generosity begins with a fresh rededication of ourselves to the Lord to understand what he's done for us, to understand how much he loves us, to understand that he promises to never leave us or forsake us. A rededication, a representing of ourselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So when you face every year opportunities for generosity, the first move is to give yourself again to Jesus. Now, think about what that means with me, okay? That means... Here I am, Jesus, all of me. Not just Sunday morning, not just 10%. Here I am, all of me. And you can do with me and all that you've given me anything at all that you would desire to do.
That's what it means to present yourself first to the Lord. But then he goes on. Look at verse 5. He says, They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. That doesn't seem right. But Paul is saying the Macedonians gave their hearts to Paul. They gave their hearts to the church. One of the inspiring motives of surprising generosity is love. Love for your church. I love this church. And it inspires Laurie and me to give. And I'm not shaming or guilting anybody when I simply ask this question. Do you love your church? If you do, reflect upon that and then respond in generosity. You know, I hesitate even to do this, but I have to 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 interpret the text well. I have to ask you, do you love me? Do, Do you love the way I pastor this church? Do you love the way I teach? Do you love the staff of this church, not just me? And Paul unashamedly says the example of the Macedonians is they gave themselves first to Jesus and then yes, they they even gave their hearts to us. And that motivated and inspired surprising generosity. Let me just go through a few of the things that, that your church has done because of your generosity to Jesus? Did you know we've given hundreds and hundreds of dollars this year to a Native American tribe in Mississippi for the purpose of translating a Bible into their native language? Do you know we've given tens of thousands of dollars this year to U.S. ministry partners to help them cope with COVID shortfalls? We even gave $1,000 to the Fairfield High School football team to try to show them that the church isn't just about what they might consider spiritual things, but in fact that all of life is spiritual, even football. Think about Fairfield and how that high school now looks at Oak Mountain. We've given $2,500 extra this year. We already give to Wellhouse, the ministry's sexually trafficked women, We gave extra monies this year because of COVID. We've given hundreds of dollars to a church plant in North Dakota, the only PCA church plant in the entire state. Did you know we're helping to plant a church in North Dakota? We've given hundreds to the Jesus Film Project this year. Sacred Road, Uh, Chris Granberry and Mary Granberry in Washington uh, at White Swan, uh, the Native American ministry. They're actually going to plant a church. How exciting is that? Not only did that ministry begin with Chris leaving this church and going out there, but now they're going to plant a church on another Native American region. And they're going to do that in Oregon. We've been giving to that. We've given over $50,000 a year to Evangel Presbytery. That's our presbytery, and much of that goes to church planting. We've given thousands to the PCA Unity Fund, which trains diverse people of color for church planting so that the PCA might look a lot more like America looks. We've given over $50,000 to campus ministries in Alabama this year. We've given $100,000 to Urban Ministries, Urban Hope, Restoration Academy, Hope Health, Grace House, Urban Young Life, Clear Story. And over the past several years, we've given over a quarter of a million dollars to people in this church so that they could adopt children in this church. I love this church. And I'm going to give myself afresh to Jesus And I'm going to give myself afresh to this church. And I'm going to ask you unapologetically, will you join me in doing the same thing? And then lastly, excel in surprising generosity propelled 
by obedience. Here we get to verse 15 and the manna principle. Okay, if, if you needed convincing that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, if you needed any more convincing through 2 Corinthians that there's the unity and continuity of the covenant of grace through two different administrations of that covenant, here it is again. Paul talks about Exodus 16 just as if it applies just as much to us as it did to the people of Israel in the wilderness. And God tells the people of Israel in Exodus 16, you will only have an omer per person of manna. Now, some of you are strong, some of you are vigorous, some of you can gather a whole bunch. You might even, I have a little grass catcher behind my rotting lawnmower. It scoops up the pine needles so that Lori don't have to buy pine needles. We can just scoop them up. You may have one of those, Moses says. Okay, he probably didn't have say that. But the point is, there are all kinds of ways to, to, to gather manna. Paul says, it doesn't matter. The point was never that you gather as much as you can. Well, actually it was, but, but only so you could give it away. And the person who's weak, who's sick, who's old, who's infirm, and they can't get out and gather enough to have an omer per person, well then, they're never supposed to have lack. You're never supposed to have too much. You're never supposed to have lack. Now, in the older expression of the covenant, uh, it was often more visible and material as far as the blessings and uh, discipline of God. And so in the older uh, establishment of the covenant, the, the manna stank. It, it rotted. It had worms. So if, if you weren't participating in generosity, the whole neighborhood knew it. Your house stunk. You had worms crawling out of your door. And everybody knew, ha ha, they weren't generous. Now, in the newer administration of the covenant, we don't have those external things as much. It's all, it's all internal, spiritual, and from the heart. But God knows. God knows. And Paul is saying, practice the manna principle. By the way, if you needed more convincing that uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament are united, the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, this is what he's referring to. Give us our manna. And everything else, it's still yours. And may we be surrendered to use it, to give it, however you want us to. Ernest Shackelford was an Irish explorer who in 1908 tried to lead the first expedition to the South Pole. He didn't make it. He stopped 97 miles short. He got closer than anybody had ever gotten before, but they ran out of supplies. They had one hardtack left per person. You know what hardtack is? Hardtack is like a hockey puck. It's a biscuit that is just hard as rock, but it's filled with uh, nutrients and protein and things like that. So he gave each man their last hardtack biscuit. Some of them put them in their knapsacks. Others of them quickly melted some ice, made some tea, and, and ate their tea and biscuit. Th that night, uh, they realized they were not going to make it. They were going to have to turn around. They only had one biscuit each, and some of those were gone. Shackelford lay there, worried about his men, had trouble falling asleep, and he noticed movement out of the corner of his eye. And his best man, his right-hand man, was looking around to see if anybody was watching him. Shackelford's heart sank. This is my best guy. This is my right-hand man. Sure enough, that guy got up very stealthily, quietly, looked around some more. And Shackelford was just 
he was just wrecked as he saw this, this, this great explorer of his reach into the backpack of another explorer. Shackford knew what was going to happen, but he didn't. His right-hand guy, his best man, took the biscuit from his own backpack and placed it into the backpack of the guy who had already eaten his. That, people, is surprising generosity. That is giving when it wasn't asked for. That is begging for the privilege of participating in generosity. And that is sacrificing way above what's expected. May we be empowered by grace. May we be inspired by our Savior who gave everything for us. May we be inspired by the Macedonians who modeled Christ-like sacrifice. And then may we simply choose by grace to obey. Tithe is the floor. Surprising generosity has no ceiling. Will you give yourselves afresh? First to Jesus. And then, unapologetically, will you give yourselves to us? Oak Mountain. Let's pray. Father, your word is so challenging, yet at the same time so encouraging. It's filled with inspiration, not just words that are inspired, but, but accounts that in and of themselves are, are inspirational to our lives, to our choices. God, thank you for grace that has more power than we could ever fathom. God, thank you that that you love us whether we give generously or not. But your grace longs to change us. And so, Lord, here we are. We present ourselves right now to you afresh. And God, if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know Jesus, that has never presented themselves to Jesus for eternal life, may now be the very moment they do so. In Jesus' name, amen.